Graduate Studies in Public Policy. Thanks. Can you hear me okay? Thank you for being here this afternoon um, for the Carson Scholar Lightning Talk series, Resilience in the 21st Century. And our theme this evening is sustain. The Carson Scholar Program is a science communication program committed to training the next generation of environmental researchers in the art of public communication. We aim to build a network of graduate students across the university devoted to furthering their capacity to communicate their work to the public, decision makers, through training, through writing, and through outreach. Our program is named in honor of Rachel Carson, mother of the modern environmental movement in the United States, and a science communicator extraordinaire. It's a real pleasure to share this work with two wonderful colleagues and fellow mentors, Chris Kokinas in the back and Kevin Bonine. Thank you for your work and your service to this program. And thank you to Ariane for her wonderful work as a program coordinator and making it all happen. We are really fortunate to receive broad financial support across the university and from private donors. And we just wanna take a moment to acknowledge the funding and the support that we receive. We're now in the 10th year of the program here at the university. We've worked with more than 100 scholars across 25 different disciplines, and we've raised and awarded more than a half a million dollars. We have some alums of the program in the audience with us here today. So thanks for coming out and being part of the network. This is how it's gonna work this evening. We have four Carson scholars that are part of the current cohort, Talia, Eden, Erisbeth, and Diana. They'll present their work in a lightning talk format, which is approximately seven minutes each, and they'll each go, and then we'll have a 15 or 20 minutes for Q&A at the end. I mentioned this is the second event in this series of lightning talks. We had the first event last week as part of the Earth Week events on campus, and we have our third one um, tomorrow evening. Same room, same time, same station, so we hope you'll join us tomorrow as well. I'm pleased to turn it over to Talia to get us started. So welcome, thanks for being here. Okay, uh, welcome everyone to tonight's Carson Scholar Talks. So as Andrea said, tonight we're gonna focus on the theme of sustain. And so drawing on our different backgrounds in geography, ecology, and engineering, uh, each of us examines a problem that relates to sustainability. So our research seeks solutions uh, to complex issues, including climate forecasting, uh, urban development, food systems, infrastructure, um, and food systems and renewable energy. And so our talks tonight will bring you to the highlands of Guatemala, back to our own community in Tucson, and then to Cajiado County in Kenya. Uh, so along the way, we'll propose some innovative solutions that support sustainable and just futures. Okay. Okay, so with that, I'll start. <laughs> Um, my name is Talia Anderson, and I'm a PhD student in the School of Geography, Development, and Environment, and I'm going to start off tonight by talking about what's going on with the rains. Um, and although the rains were pretty wild today in Tucson, we're actually going to transport from Tucson to Central America, which is where my PhD research is focused. Uh, so you might be wondering why Central America? Uh, well, one reason is we know that uh, rainfall is especially important in this region for uh, over a million families uh, that rely on that rainfall for agriculture throughout this uh, region called the dry, dry corridor. So that includes parts of Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, and Nicaragua. Um, and many of the families that live in this region have really small farms and produce food to use them to produce food to support their families. Uh, so you can imagine that the timing and the amount of rainfall is really important uh, because it's linked to the success of their crops in any given year. Uh, so specifically, I'm focusing on Guatemala. 
And what's really interesting about Guatemala is that uh, over recent years, uh, farmers have been noticing uh, changes in climate. And so specifically, they've talked about changes in uh, what's known as the midsummer drought. So that's a short dry spell that occurs every year during the growing season and how it's gotten longer and less predictable in its timing. Um, and as a result, uh, many people have suffered from pretty severe crop loss. Um, and so what's curious though, is that when we look at measurements of rainfall from weather stations and satellites, we don't see the same changes. So I'm just gonna move this. Um, so here you're looking at a map of Central America um, and where and the changes in rainfall over the last 40 years. And so where it's brown, that means it's gotten drier and where it's blue, that means it's gotten wetter. I um, mean, the areas that are outlined in black, like you can see here, are where we're really confident in the changes that have occurred over the last 40 years. Um, and then areas that don't have any outlines, like all of El Salvador, uh, that's where changes are less certain um, and we don't, we aren't as confident as to if it's getting drier or wetter. Um, and so what you'll notice is that in Guatemala, there's some places it's getting drier, others it's getting wetter, but in most of the country, uh, the signal is not particularly strong. Um, and we're not confident from this source of information that there have been uh, meaningful changes in rainfall. So we have these um, observations from farmers that climate has been changing. And then we have the data from weather stations and satellites that don't seem to show the same thing. So my role as a geographer and a climate scientist is to understand why this mismatch exists. Um, and so why the weather station data and the satellite data aren't showing the same patterns that the farmers are observing. Uh, so this summer, I'll be traveling to Guatemala to do most of my research. Um, so today, I'd like to talk about some of the reasons why we think this mismatch exists. Um, and one of the reasons we think it might exist is uh, related to different cues to measure changes in rainfall. So am I, as a climate scientist, uh, looking at something different than a farmer uh, to measure rainfall change? So for example, I often look at the number of days in the growing season that have no rain, whereas maybe a farmer is thinking about soil moisture. And so you can imagine that these different measurements might lead to different conclusions about what has happened over the last uh, few years. And so, uh, the second reason we might see this mismatch is due to highly local differences in rainfall. So um, it's very possible that the sparsely distributed weather stations and the less detailed satellite data might not be able to capture the fine differences on all these farms lining the steep mountainsides. So uh, we know that in mountain regions, uh, it creates many small microclimates. So um, it's very possible that different elevations and different ridges might experience different amounts of rainfall. And the weather stations and the satellites might not be able to capture that. Um, to add to this challenge, the number of weather stations has actually uh, decreased uh, since the late nine, or, oops, since the 1980s. So here you can see this steep drop off in the number of weather stations. Um, in the Caribbean and Central America uh, over the last, up to 2000. So uh, that makes it harder to understand what's going on locally. Um, and so, as I said, I'll be going to Guatemala this summer to think about why this mismatch uh, exists and how we can uh, uncover why it exists. And so some of the ways that I plan to do that are by installing uh, many more weather stations across uh, the mountain slopes. So um, the idea is that I'll be measuring rainfall across the mountain terrain to see if the weather stations are capturing or if the satellite data is capturing weather or rainfall at the top of the mountain or at the bottom of the, bottom of the mountain or somewhere in between or not at all. Um, I'll also be working with a team to have conversations with about 600 farmers, asking them about the changes they've observed and how they measure the changes in rainfall. Um, and so these conversations will help me uh, determine if uh, as climate scientists and farmers, we think about rain in similar or different ways. Um, and so you might be wondering why this mismatch even matters. 
Um, and one reason is that Central America is a global hotspot for future drying. So it's expected to have temperatures warm and rainfall decrease uh, by the end of the century. So this, is, this map is showing you changes in rainfall um, by 2100. And basically anywhere it's brown is expected to get drier. Anywhere it's blue is expected to get wetter. Um, and so if you zoom in on Central America, uh, you'll see that summer rainfall is expected to decrease anywhere from 30 to 50 percent. So you can imagine that would have a pretty significant impact on the farmers and the families uh, like the ones I'll be talking to that rely on that rainfall for agriculture. Um, and so while we expect these decreases in the future, uh, resolving this mismatch will help us understand the changes that are occurring now and the ones we would expect in the nearer future. Um, and then finally, uh, my goal in this project and through our collaborations in Guatemala is that um, through a better understanding of what's going on with the rain, we can um, uh, produce better rainfall forecasts and more useful climate information that supports farmers in the decisions they make, like when to plant and when to harvest. And so I'll be working with these organizations here uh, uh, to improve the climate information that's distributed to farmers in hopes that it is more uh, relevant and accessible. So that's it. Thank you. So it's Friday evening around five o'clock and I'm in Midtown Tucson. I'm sitting on a tour bus sipping tequila with 20 or so perfect strangers that mostly happen to be retirement age white folks. So I lean over to the person next to me and I ask, how did you end up here? And then I wonder to myself, how did I end up here myself? So my name is Eden Kincaid and I'm a PhD student at the U of A uh, in geography and I'm studying food tourism and food culture here in Tucson. So more specifically, my research focuses on what's called gastrotourism, which is the idea that we can use food culture and the food sector to promote urban development. So it was my PhD research that brought me onto a, uh, a tour bus um, going around to all of uh, Tucson's favorite Mexican eateries. And I took the tour because I wanted to understand the stories people tell about food in Tucson. And I also wanted to understand how food and the stories around food are being used uh, as a motor for sustainable development. Plus, uh, good food and very fancy tequila was part of the deal. So this was no ordinary food tour. It was a tour of our city of Tucson, which I don't know if you all have heard, but Tucson is the first city in the US to be designated as what's called a creative city of gastronomy. So this is a special designation from UNESCO, the United Nations Scientific, Educational and Cultural Organization. And they're folks that um, are focused on recognizing and protecting forms of intangible cultural heritage around the world. So in 2015, uh, Tucson received this designation. And the purpose of this designation is to recognize and celebrate Tucson's unique agricultural history and also its contemporary multi-ethnic food ways. Um, but the real purpose behind the designation is to encourage cities to, to look to food culture and the food sector as a motor of sustainable economic development. So when I heard about this designation, I, I was curious about why Tucson gained it in the first place. And then I also wanted to understand what our city is doing to use food to promote urban uh, economic development. So what did I find out? Uh, well, it's true that Tucson has really great food. Our food tour included uh, respados, pan dulce, and tacos, of course, and the great Sonoran cheese crisp, which is my personal favorite. Um, but this isn't the end of Tucson's food story. In fact, uh, a lot of times when we're talking about Tucson's food culture, what is left out is that we face pretty high levels of food insecurity here in Tucson. So what that means is that people in our community and in our city cannot um, reliably access uh, enough food to live uh, healthy and productive lives. So in Pima County, um, 
the food insecurity rate is 13.6%. Again, that means that 13.6% of folks cannot access enough food. Uh, and this is a bit elevated from the national average, which is 10.5%. And as you can tell from this graphic, uh, Tucson ranks pretty high in, um, as a metropolitan area in the Western and Southwestern US in terms of food insecurity. We also know that food insecurity is not evenly distributed among the population, um, but that it is racialized. So uh, as you can tell from this diagram, uh, food insecurity is disproportionately affecting uh, Hispanic communities um, and also elevated among non-white racial groups. And you can also see that the, uh, the disruptions to the food system and food access brought on by COVID-19 are also disproportionately borne by uh, Hispanic households. And we, this data does not separate indigenous folks um, out, but we do know that in Arizona, uh, indigenous communities face uh, really disproportionately high rates of food insecurity. So when we look at this broader context of food in Tucson, there's a certain kind of irony or paradox that emerges. On one hand, we're internationally recognized and known for our vibrant food culture and local food system, um, in, in large part because of indigenous and Mexican food waste. Uh, upon which the designation is based. However, it's these very populations, Hispanic or Latinx and indigenous populations that suffer disproportionately from food insecurity. So this contradiction at the center of the, the gastronomy designation led me to start asking questions about what it meant and how, how exactly we're thinking about sustainable development. Um, and it brought me to this question, is gastro development in fact a sustainable model of development? So in order to define sustainable development, um, UNESCO relies on the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals, which perhaps you all have heard of. Um, and we know that sustainable development is not only about the environment. It also includes a lot of social indicators and social issues, including, um, and goals, including reducing poverty, uh, zero hunger, and reducing inequalities in society at large. So given this broader, uh, more expansible meaning of sustainable development, I'm asking is, is gastro development meeting these goals? Is it a model of sustainable development? Um, so at present, it seems like the main thrust of Tucson's gastro development agenda is getting tourists to come and getting new residents to move here to Tucson and eat a bunch of food. Um, so the idea is that if we can attract more folks to our city and we can get them spending their money on food and also hospitality industry and other kind of cultural offerings, um, that this will increase sales taxes and that somehow this is gonna make our city a better place to live. Um, so the, the kind of underlying model here is that more consumption leads to more growth and development and that that's gonna get us where we wanna be. However, um, we have to ask, you know, what does this model of development do to address these existing inequalities that we know are shaping our food system and also our city at large? Is it trying to address these inequalities or might it in fact be exacerbating them? Uh, is this model of development, who is it for? Is it for tourists? Is it for residents? What residents? Um, how are the benefits of, this, of, this, of these development processes being shared? Are they being shared equally across different social and racial groups? So these are some of the questions I'm trying to uh, investigate in my dissertation research. And I think we really need to ask these questions um, because they begin to point to the limitations of, of this model of gastro development. Um, and we have to ask, are there alternative models that we might, we might think about in, in making gastro development a more sustainable and just uh, paradigm here? So the good news is we need to look no further than our own city and our own region for other possible models of food-based development. Um, there are plenty of projects happening here in Tucson. There's the La Dose project, and there's also groups working like Flowers and Bullets and Regeneracion. And these groups are, are trying to come up with more kind of community-based approaches to food-based development that start in the communities most affected by food insecurity and those very same communities whose food culture is the basis of this designation in the first place. So they're offering some alternative models um, of development that's really centered on social justice and the most immediate kind of uh, needs and concerns of local communities. However, um, these ideas and these visions and these perspectives don't often make it into the, the kind of dominant model of development uh, here in Tucson. 
Um, so in closing, there's a lot of work to be done to make gastro development more kind of sensitized to questions of social justice and sustainability more broadly. And we, I think we really need to begin with difficult questions about social inequality in order to um, make sure that gastro development can deliver on its promises as a model of sustainable development. Um, but I think the good news is we've got a lot of great stuff to work with. And if we kind of critically and reflexively approach these questions with questions of equity and social justice and sustainability in mind, um, that we can certainly find ways collectively to build on the vibrancy of our local food system and celebrate um, the food heritage of this region while also addressing some pressing environmental and social uh, problems facing our city. Thank you. Hi, my name is Arisberi Barranieblas, and I'm a PhD student here at the University of Arizona in the program of environmental engineering. And today I'm gonna to be speaking about corrosion in water delivery pipes. So beneath our feet here in Tucson, Arizona, there are about 4,600 miles of pipeline that is like driving to New York City and back. These pipelines Pipelines transport and deliver drinking water to customers all over the city. And most of these pipes are made of metal. If a metal corrodes, it breaks down. Because corrosion is inedible for most materials and metals. Corrosion leads to pipes breaking or leaking, which leads to economic loss, inconvenience to daily activities, and loss of water, which in Arizona is a very precious resource. But what is corrosion? Um, corrosion is when a material chemically reacts with its environment and becomes weaker as a result. Take this steel pipe, for example. Um, it's in contact with water, and it's also in contact with oxygen, like the type we breathe in. And through chemical reactions, it, gets, it starts rusting. And over time, it gets weaker until it breaks or leaks. Corrosion rates tell us how fast metal is corroding, but these are difficult to predict because corrosion is a very complex process that depends on many different factors. One factor that can make these predictions more difficult are the decrease in water use per capita. This is a trend of cities all over the world where people are using less water, and this changes the amount of time the water is sitting inside the pipes or moving. And we are not, and we don't know how this is going to affect the corrosion rates on a long term. Another factor that makes corrosion rates more difficult to predict is the the, um, the water conditions changing of the water that's being transported in the pipes. For example, in Tucson, when in 1992, when they started using water from the Colorado River instead of groundwater. There were so many corrosion problems and so many pipe fillers all over the city. And both of these waters were drinkable waters, but they were different. And because they were different, they had different effects on the corrosion of these pipes. So which water conditions affect the corrosion rate of metal? Well, a lot of them, but these are um, a, a, some examples like the water flow, water pressure, the amounts of oxygen in the water, the temperature of the water, the types of salts in the amounts, and also water acidity or pH. But how do we find the corrosion rates of metal? Um, there are several. This is the most common one. It involves having a piece of metal, you weigh it, you put it in water, you let it sit there for weeks or months, and you come back and you weigh it again. And that's how you get the 
corrosion rate, but it's an average over a long period of time. So if the water conditions were different and affected the corrosion rate on a day, we wouldn't know because it's only an average. On the other hand, there's also an electrochemical method, the one I'm using for my research. And this one, we can get the corrosion rate in a matter of minutes. And this allows us to relate it to real time water conditions that ultimately will help us predict corrosion rates. So what is the solution? I have been building a computer automated system that can do two things. One is monitoring corrosion rates of metal and two, monitor water conditions in real time. Hopefully we can relate both of these two. And this is how it looks. <laughs> this is the system I've been working on and it's at the lab right now. And here are some of the results. So when we have water flowing versus non-flowing, we found out the corrosion rate is higher. When we have the higher temperature, we also get higher corrosion rate. Another result we have is when we have amount of oxygen in the water and it's higher, it also increases the corrosion rate. So what is the next step? The next step is do the same thing we're doing in the lab, but now install it and test it out in the field in one of Tucson's water testing sites. And from this second location, send the data back to the station we have at the lab and compare them. And the ultimate goal for this project is to set up different stations of this system throughout the city that will ultimately help with the maintenance and replacement of pipes before these break or leak, which will help us preserve water and also preserve the water delivery infrastructure. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I have a quick question for you all. When was the last time you spent 24 hours without electricity? I can see your faces. It's an unimaginable experience for most of you. And probably to some, it was out of choice when last weekend you decided to go and hike in the wilderness and you did not carry your torch. Anyway, this is the reality for 750 million people, majority of whom are from developing countries. They lack access to affordable and reliable electricity. My name is Diana Gidu, and I am a second year PhD student in the Arid Land Resource Science Program. And I'll be talking to you today about harvesting the sun twice. What does it really mean to not have electricity? It means children not being able to do their homeworks after sunset, men and women not being able to cook their dinner after the sun goes down or doing it in darkness. Families not being able to enjoy conversations after dinner because you know, it's dark, right? And you can't make all the faces for your kids because they can't see all the expressions you make. In Kenya, where I come from, over 80% of rural households depend mostly on firewood as their source of energy. Mostly of that is used for cooking. What that means, is that trees are cut down, there's unsustainable management of forest, and this turns up to this huge cycle of land degradation, climate change, and all this is related to poverty, hunger, and malnutrition. Technologies that are able to address such challenges are much needed in the developing world. One such technology, we can all smile, is agrivoltaics. Agrivoltaics is a science that involves the raising of solar panels several meters above the ground and allowing for crop production beneath them. 
when I first had this technology, I was mind blown. Because this means we have three benefits out of it. One, the panels are able to harvest energy from the sun and provide electricity for electrification. Two, we do not have a food versus fuel conflict because the panels are at the top and you're producing your food from beneath. Therefore, there's no food versus fuel conflict. And at the same time, you're able to address food insecurity by planting crops beneath, right? And thirdly, which is also another important factor, is that the panels can harvest the water and this water can be used for household use. Let me put it into perspective. It looks something like this. So in the middle of nowhere in Kenya, as long as you get the project done, you put up an agrivoltaic system like that, have your panels in it. So you have your panels on it and then the water is harvested, the water goes to the storage. So the water can be used for irrigation, the water can be used for household use, the water can be used for livestock. At the same time, uh, the energy can be used for household electrification. It can be used for food processing. It can be used for AC, you know, when there is extreme climate events. And lastly, the panels are able to create a microclimate, which allows for plants that will not have otherwise grown in the same place to grow in such areas. So the panels are able to do that by providing a shade which reduces the amount of water that is lost from the soil. And so when the soil is able to hold more water, then you can plant more drought tolerant, plants that will have otherwise not survived in drought tolerant conditions. So my PhD is about trying to turn all that good science into practice. Currently, agrivoltaics has not gotten traction in any part of the continent, not just Kenya. Therefore, there are so many things that need to be studied before that can be implemented. So my research objective is to see if we, I can develop a social technical system that will allow for the equitable distribution of renewable energy to, dis, to the deserving communities. To do that, I'm looking at three perspectives. One, the resource users. Two, the resource units. And thirdly, the governance systems. So let's take a journey on each. So the resource users, on whose land will this project be implemented? Why start from one part of the country over another? Who is going to give up, who is going to give the resources that are needed, the financing to implement such a project? What is, is there capacity in the country for this project to be able to run in terms of scientists who will be able to repair the panels if they stop working or Scientists will be able to educate the communities on how to transfer this energy from where it's produced, you know, to the rest of the country where it's needed. Thirdly, secondly, the resource users. Currently, this is what is popular with most people, having panels on top of your houses or having uh, panels at the top of your building to provide energy for, you know, institutions and, and buildings or shopping malls panels in the parking garages to cover the cars while at the same time providing energy. So what does this change in system mean for these resource users? There's, an adopt, there's a layer, there's a different layer to it in terms of how people will be willing to adopt such a technology. So my, part of my research question is to also answer questions related to what the people think about it. And lastly, the third thing is the governance systems. So agrivoltaics can either be developed by you know, the different countries in Africa, each government choosing to finance and implement it, or the private sector can jump into it and implement it, or the public and the private sector can come together through the public-private partnerships and eventually develop these projects. So right now, me and my lab, we've been able to come up with a demonstration plot in Kenya in a place called Kajiado. We have two acres of land where agrivoltaics is being implemented. Actually, this photo is an actual true figure of the thing on the ground. And we are trying to use that to come up with figures and see the cost implications, the benefits, and so that we can be able to know how exactly upscaling and replicating this project to the rest of the country will look like. Ladies and gentlemen, and everyone included, nobody taxes the sun yet, so we might as well jump on the opportunity. Thank you.
Hello? Thank you, um, scholars. Let's have another round of applause for them. What a great job. I'm, I'm Chris Cochino, I'm one of the mentors. I'll be the MC. I'm gonna hand this, this is the, the shared microphone. <laughs> um, so this is a chance for you to ask um, some questions of our scholars uh, individually or collectively. Um, and so we can uh, see if we have any questions online and um, thank you for helping me <laughs> keep track of this. So any, any questions or comments? Thank you very much, Chris. And thanks to the four of you fabulous talks on such a diverse range of topics. Diana, my question is for you, how much of the success of these programs relies on some version of battery technology or energy storage? And how much uh, sort of thought have you put into that as part of this whole system? Thank you for the good question. Yeah. Um... Definitely the quality of the panels play a big and important role on the success of such a project. And uh, um, so there's also the aspect of trying to get the panels and outsourcing them from different countries and the cost involved with trying to do that. The service setting up panels that can, stro that can store the energy locally in Kenya. So part of the reasons why we have that demonstration plot is to be able to see the differences between these three options. We can have storage panels taken from uh, you know, China or some place in Europe vis-a-vis -vis -vis, uh, having the scientists in the country trying to develop things based on the circumstances and locally available materials. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, in the back. Getting my steps in today. Thank you so much for those wonderful presentations. I have a question for Talia. So how consistent is the data that you are, go that are coming from those weather stations? Because one of the main challenges that we have in developing countries is that you know, access to data or reliability of the data. That's a, whoa, that was loud. Uh, that's a really great question. Yeah, so as I showed that graph, right, a lot of um, weather station data has actually declined over time and we don't have reliable data, um, but we're working with these um, agroclimate roundtable groups in Guatemala to install many different weather stations in a few different communities and they've actually been doing that already and so we'll supplement what they already have in place and there's actually an app uh, that they have um, where there's live data from the stations they already have on the ground. So we'll have that too. And then you can also go back uh, through and look at data from each of these stations. So hopefully the data will be reliable. You know, it's challenging in mountain areas where you don't necessarily have a uh, reliable service, but we're hoping to get around some of those uh, challenges. And hopefully they stay in place for many years to come, right? Because we need long, long data sets. Yeah, thanks. I actually have a follow up on that. Can can you describe like how mm. how robust are these monitors that you'll be putting? I mean, are they big, small. hefty? Yeah, no, okay. really small. They're going to be pretty small um, little stations. Yeah, and we're trying to. That's one of the things I'm working on right now is working with um, the two communities to figure out what stations they already have, which ones they like to use, which ones work best when you don't have good service. But they're actually pretty small. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Other questions? I have a, a question, if I may, for, for actually I have several questions, but I'll just, Eden, can, I was wondering if in, and maybe it's too early to, to sort of ask this question, and but you could talk through that as well, looking at gastro development in Tucson and how you know, what, what's then say even just like the regional context, are there other cities doing this kind of thing? Um, and, and, you know, can you do any sort of comparative thinking about what, what that looks like? Are they doing a more sustainable job or yeah, is it too early to say? Yeah, great question. Um, so there are these cities of gastronomy all over the world. 
Uh, Tucson was the first here um, in the US, but there's also San Antonio. Um, but more broadly, uh, beyond just this particular UNESCO designation, this is kind of an idea that is um, circulating far beyond that um, as cities try to find more kind of creative ways to, to pursue development. Um, in terms of, so there, there's, yeah, there's certainly cities of gastronomy all over the world and these kind of projects all over. Um, that would be useful to look at. In terms of the scholarship, uh, this whole kind of term is pretty recently coined. Um, and I just read a great book, actually, it's called The $16 Taco uh, by Pascal Josart Marcelli, who's a geographer at uh, in San Diego. So there's this great study that's got a lot of comparative points with uh, Tucson. Um, but in San Diego, it seems to be a similar kind of story. Um, there's these dynamics of, um, yeah, there's a, a lot of the same questions about cultural appropriation and about food justice and food insecurity and some of the contradictions of this model. Um, so yeah, I think there's definitely potential to, to look at other, other places and, you know, it's a model that's all over the world. So it's important that we, uh, really look at its potentials and its limitations. Try to get it right. Thank you. Question. Back here. Yeah, thank you for your presentations. Um, this is a simple question. Um, I don't know if you have this data. I forgot your name, but um, it is safe to drink water from Tucson, from the faucet. Um, and if you know if there is any difference, depending on where you are, uh, like I expect in like, a, for example, in Mexico City, where I live a lot of time, there was the quality was completely different if you are in the poor zones, depending on the richest zones. And this, and yeah, do you have some that kind sort of data? Thank you. We 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 laugh, but I think it's a laughter of recognition that we have that that we have that question. So, okay, I'm gonna try to address everything. <laughs> um, water quality is different depending in the location and where it's sourced. Like for example, our water comes from the Colorado River and then it's blended with the groundwater we already have. And we use the aquifers to actually filtrate the water and it's more homogeneous that way. Because if you get water from like the surface, it's not homogeneous. So that's when you have to do extra things maybe to have it like drinkable. Um, but if it's groundwater, it's usually homogeneous and usually um, less treatment required. Um, and it is safe to drink this <laughs> water. And, and I don't remember. Was there a second second part to the question? Oh, uh, yeah. And so, yeah, variations across the city in terms of. Oh, so he, here in Tucson, or, yeah, there so. are variations because we get the water from different wells. So, different locations of the city get the water from different wells. For example, um, like last year during June, we were still using a well that was close to the airport, but then there were there was a problem with the levels of PFAS there it was too high in order to use the water. So they had to close that well. And now the customers who got the water from there have to get it from another well. But the customers of their homes don't know this, just like to some waters, like, you know, like um, getting water from different wells. <laughs> Just to keep it safe. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Th thank you. Um, great. We have a question from online and then we'll take two in the back. So this is um, my glasses. Uh, this is a question for Eden. Uh, who bears the responsibility for shifting towards sustainable food based development in Tucson? If the powers that be are unwilling to make the necessary economic restructuring, what could we do? What could community members or, or business owners do? The big question. Oh my goodness, it is indeed a big question that maybe I'll understand at the end of my dissertation. Um, but thank you for the question and for pulling my attention out into this larger frame. Um, well, I think it might be too soon to say that the powers that be are unwilling to make necessary economic restructuring. I mean, one of the paradoxes I look at in my research is a lot of the contradictions of this model of development are actually contradictions of capitalism uh, and capitalist development. Um, so this idea that we need to keep growing and keep consuming indefinitely and more and more in order to produce value, um, that's a problem of an underlying kind of economic paradigm that I don't, I don't know, 
what any of us actors are necessarily going to do to deal with that. Um, so, so I think it probably starts with dialogue um, in terms of addressing the more kind of uh, concrete issues here in our city. I think it means um, opening up who we imagine to be a stakeholder in, uh, in gastro development, um, bringing in community groups and folks doing more grassroots work and trying to reckon with um, their visions and their, their critiques. Um, so I think before, yeah, before we throw it all out or, or think that, you know, um, these contradictions are kind of final or irresolvable. Um, yeah, I think we just need to have more critical conversations and kind of enlarge our vision and ask some of these critical questions. Because I think the real stumbling block is that um, folks involved in this work, there's kind of a assumption about what development means. And there's not too much um, conversation or questioning. Everyone kind of assumes that we all mean the same thing by development. And I think, uh, especially here in Tucson, where the history of urban development is super racialized and inequitable, that different communities uh, have very different ideas about urban development and who it's for and what the costs and benefits are. Um, so yeah, I think just expanding, expanding the audience and um, yeah, just trying to incorporate uh, more diverse visions and see if we can't build some kind of local alternatives that do push back on some of these uh, larger constraints. Thanks for the question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Eden. Um, there were, I think, multiple hands up in, in the back. So we'll, I'll start with the first one I saw. Uh, thank you for the presentations. Um, my question is about water, um, in, especially with Tucson with all these new developments. How's that gonna impact like wells and corrosion and connections to older pipes? Um, regarding the new developments, how it's going to affect, um, I wouldn't know how to uh, answer that question. <laughs> regarding the corrosion, um, I, I don't, from what I understand, <laughs> um, I don't know how to answer the corrosion. You're asking if the new pipes are gonna make it um, affect the corrosion rates. If it's newer pipe, um, they're good. <laughs> they're not gonna be able, to, uh, they don't need to be replaced or anything. The older pipes are the ones that um, need to be replaced sooner. Um, I, they're still gonna have to monitor the, all the pipes. So all the different wells, the water that comes out, it's monitored just to see um, they use other things right now, like the Langer Index, just to, and other methods, just to see how corrosive the water is in that location. So it's still going to be done if there are more new wells or new developments. They're still going to monitor the corrosion of, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for the wonderful presentations. By the way, um, Arisbeth, I'm sorry to hit you with the back-to-back -back question. Um, I was curious because your research sounds absolutely fascinating, but I did want to know if you touch at all on places like Flint, Michigan, where um, water corrosion has been an issue, and if not, is it possible that your model could be applied in places like that to help solve some of their pipe issues? Um, so I'm going to start with the last part. So this model, um, this system, if it works, it can be applied anywhere. Um, one thing that any city, or there were also um, some people in the research team were thinking like in buildings, like, like has a lot of floors, lots of pipes. Um, they were also thinking that could be useful for buildings like that. Um, but to monitor for other water parameters, all we would do is like add more sensors. So like a um, another person, the research team is working like a lead sensor that could monitor like um, different like lower levels too. Um, so for my system, if we wanted to monitor like lead, we just add another sensor to it. Or, yeah. Okay, thank you. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I was gonna, we have time for another question or two, so. So this, this question is for Diana. So you said that agrivoltaics is pretty new in Kenya, 
what do you think that will be the main challenge to implement agriwell takes in in Kenya considering that considering that it's a developing country? That's a really uh, great question and very important and part of the reasons why I'm doing this research. Actually, that is like the main question I'm trying to answer through my research because it's not just copying and pasting this technology. There are so many non-ideal situations in the country that will have to be dealt with fast. Um, energy in Kenya is mostly a monopolistic market which means it's only the government that supplies the energy to its populace and distributes it. But there is a lot of private investors who are able to bring in solar panels and that is given to people. So there are lax policies that are, that are able to control how that is done. And the amount of voltage that is given to individuals is really little compared to how much agrivoltaics will be able to produce. And for it to be beneficial and cost-effective, agrivoltaics will have to be done on large scale, and then that energy will have to be distributed back to the grid, right? So we definitely need political goodwill from our leaders to be able to do this. Our demonstration plot currently is backed up by the support of the government. And initially when we started, they were not on board yet, but then we did the two acres and the community around there did not have to buy electricity anymore. And so there was missing income. And then there was like, okay, so what's going on? <laughs> and then now they came back. And so now they're like, okay, it seems like it can work if it can offer electricity to, you know, this, the, the community around. So yeah, it's a conversation that really needs to happen. There's land challenges, issues. Land in Kenya is, especially in the range lands where such a technology will be implemented is communally owned. So which community is willing to give their land for such a project to be implemented? Yeah, if you think about the financing, there's the private sector who might have the expertise and the money, but without the support of the government, they might take advantage of the communities and the people who are, who are in the area, right? So there's a, lot, there's a lot of give and take and lots of negotiations, collaboration, leadership, learning, relearning that needs to go into the process. And so I just started the program. So I'm trying to see if I can come up with a social technical system that addresses how this is going to happen in practice. So I realized my PhD cannot be a feasibility study of something that hasn't happened. So having a demonstration plot really helps with having something that says, okay, we've done it on two acres. This is how it will look when extrapolated. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. Any uh, last, last question before we move into our last quick lightning round raffle phase, I think is what we're doing next. So I'll just, okay, I'll give it over to Kevin who may have a question or um, another announcement and thank you all so much. I, I do have a question. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, when, I, when I put on my sort of public engagement hat, I think of citizen science and opportunities for folks to collect data, you know, whether they are, um, you know, uh, adults or children at school or those sorts of things. Have you guys thought about how some of that might be useful? I expect in thinking about uh, rainfall in Guatemala, that's actually a big part of what you're trying to do is figure out what data are people already collecting. I think Eden, you would have plenty of folks who would be happy to tell you about tequila and tacos in Tucson if, if collecting those data would somehow be helpful. Um, but have others of you thought about ways that you might be able to not only educate folks, but also collect data at the same time that might be valuable for your work. Uh, great question. So I don't personally um, do any such thing like this, but I can speak to how this might play into uh, devising better models of um, gastro development. So one of the projects I mentioned is the Lodose project, which is a project here in Tucson that um, looks at the uh, corridor where there's a lot of um, mostly Mexican restaurants um, on 12th. And they've been doing a project for a couple of years. There's a whole report that you can check out. Um, we're basically, yeah, it was in this model of participatory action research where folks, um, I think especially youth from the community were trained to um, kind of be ethnographers 
of their own neighborhoods. Um, so the idea was to kind of catalog community assets um, that can be the basis of a more kind of community-based uh, vision of, of development um, that starts from, from those very neighborhoods. Um, so that's a super cool project. If you're interested in these things, I'd encourage you to check it out. And I think it's about to start a second, um, second iteration. Um, so that's nothing I'm involved in, but um, it is one way in which that kind of approach um, fits into this larger topic of gastro development. Yeah, um, that was a good question. Uh, we also, uh, so in talking about the rainfall stations, like the question that was asked earlier, um, the Ministry of Agriculture, who are some of the people that we're working with, they, uh, a lot of farmers actually um, have small rain gauges on their farms and report back uh, when they get rain and when they don't. And so uh, that's another rich like set of web weather station data, just the rain data, but that's what I'm interested in, obviously. So um, that's another kind of piece that would kind of round out um, the information the farmers are collecting that data. So that's really cool. And then another piece is that, you know, we know that not all of these farmers have access to the climate information that they might want. Um, and so another piece is figuring out um, who is getting the information and who isn't. Um, so there's a couple WhatsApp groups where people send out um, forecasts and different things. And I can tell you that they're pretty small compared to the amount of numbers of farmers that we expect in these regions. So it's, we, you know, like figuring out who's in these groups and who isn't, is also important. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so thinking about civic education in terms of food, water and energy nexus, and mostly because the people who are mostly affected are vulnerable communities. Um, well, they have already been fast hit by the impacts of climate change. They are the ones who experience the changes that climate change bring to them. And then it's now magnified and the rest of the world feels it. And energy in Kenya is a very interesting conversation. As I previously said, it's a monopolistic market and it's a government affair. So you can imagine every political year, that is something that is used. I'll bring electricity to you people, right? And so there have been so many campaigns. One famous one is the last mile project that is trying to electrify everyone in Kenya. So we, this is an electioneering period. We have elections in August and the current government says, so far it has done you know, almost 80% electrification, which is true, but how, how uh, convenient is this energy that is provided? Is it just lighting or is it just, is it enough to provide refrigeration to, to provide a manufacturing company with energy enough to run a system, right? So yeah, so the community needs to understand it's not just the bulb, right? And having light in your household, it goes beyond that. And it's something that, even our project uh, is hoping to achieve. And that's why the government really needs to be involved because the buck starts with them. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. Those were uh, fabulous responses. Uh, a few thank yous, and then I'll tell you sort of what the next steps are. So Ariana, thank you so much for your organization and putting all this together. Chris and Andrea for your mentorship and leadership. And uh, to you in the audience for being here to support the students, but also to learn a little bit about the work they're doing and how it connects to our communities. Uh, and finally, obviously to our four scholars today, fabulous talks that they worked very hard on and took uh, a lot of critiques very, um, what's the word I wanna look for? Without throwing things, very um, politely maybe? Gracious, that's probably the word I was looking for, thank you. You guys did a wonderful job. So a round of applause, please, for everybody. So I've been told that we have some more appetizers out uh, in the courtyard, and we have some raffle items. And uh, the idea here is we want you to stick around a little bit. We want you to talk. We want you to connect with the scholars, ask them more questions, ask them the questions you were embarrassed to ask before. Um, and uh, we will interrupt you with raffle items over the next few minutes as we do that. And if this was interesting to you and you enjoyed it, please come back tomorrow evening for four different talks. Thank you so much.